This is a short video on chickenpox and shingles. I'll be describing the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of both chickenpox and shingles. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and repopulating the flowchart as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started. Both of these diseases, chickenpox and shingles, both start with a virus called varicella zoster virus. This is abbreviated VZV on this flowchart and in other sources, and it's actually a herpes virus, a human herpes virus type 3. Now there are a few ways that this virus can be transmitted, and they're listed here. It can firstly be transmitted by airborne droplets, by direct skin contact with vesicles that you'll have on the skin. Uh, we'll talk about those more as we talk about chickenpox and shingles. And it can also be transmitted transplacentally. So if a mother has a varicella infection, she can give that to the fetus. In any case, when it's transmitted the first time, it causes chickenpox. This is when the virus spreads from the mucosa or the epidermal lesions to regional lymphoid tissue, and then it causes a viremia. So essentially, you're getting this virus via droplets, via skin, vesicle fluids, or transplacentally, and then you have the virus infecting throughout your body, causing a viremia and causing a number of symptoms. During this stage, you're highly contagious. It's very infectious. From around two days before the exanthem onset to five days after the exanthem onset. And the exanthem is characterized by many, many vesicles throughout the body. And those vesicles will change with time and they have a characteristic distribution. And we'll discuss all of that. While you have this first infection, this chickenpox viremia, the virus travels through local sensory nerves, and it actually remains dormant in the dorsal root ganglia. This will become relevant later when we talk about shingles and how that starts. For now, in immunocompromised patients, it can actually recause a viremia in some uncommon cases, but let's focus on chickenpox a little bit longer. So let's get into the manifestations of chickenpox. First, you'll have an incubation period after being infected. This is usually around two weeks long, but it can range from 10 to 21 days. And then you'll have a prodrome period. This usually lasts two to three days, and it tends to be rare in young children. It's more common to have a prodrome in young adults or um, older adults. During this prodrome phase, you'll have kind of non-specific viral symptoms. These are listed here. You can have fever, malaise, headache, and muscle and joint pain. Then comes the exanthem phase. This is what varicella, this is what chickenpox is known for. You'll have sequential eruption of lesions, which are at multiple stages of evolution at once. This means that it'll look like some of the lesions have just started, and then other lesions will have burst and be almost done, will be almost scarred or hyperpigmented uh, post-inflammatory lesions. So let's talk a little bit more about these lesions. They start as papules, then they kind of progress to superficial vesicles that are filled with clear fluid. They tend to be surrounded by an erythematous base. This is where you get the description, dew drop on a rose petal. That's characteristic to varicella as well as many other herpes virus lesions. Then after the dew drop on a rose petal pattern, they become umbilicated and crusted. They then scab and the scab falls off, which can leave a depressed base. You can then have post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and you can also have punched out scars, a characteristic chickenpox scar that's also called a pock mark. So what we meant by this multiple stages of evolution at once is that you'll have both dew drops on a rose petal and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on the same body part right next to each other. So you can have very different stages right next to each other, multiple stages of evolution at once. In terms of location, the lesions start in the central body, so that's your face, your scalp, your trunk. It then progresses to the extremities. It tends to affect the oral and genital mucosa as well, and it tends to spare the palms and soles. If you have lesions on the palms and soles, you might suspect it's another viral infection. So there are actually some features of severe varicella that are worth knowing. This is the, just kind of the typical presentation that you might see in an unvaccinated child. These features of severe varicella are as follows. You can have a prolonged high fever lasting over a week. You can have prolonged vesicle eruption lasting more than five days. You can have thrombocytopenia, which might result in hemorrhagic skin lesions like purpura. You can also have visceral dissemination 
of the virus, which can lead to encephalitis and pneumonia and other complications. These are some risk factors for these severe courses of varicella zoster infection. It tends to be worse in children that are older as well as adults, so age of 12 years or older. It tends to be worse in people who are immunocompromised in pregnancy and in infancy. So there really is kind of a sweet spot for this varicella infection. And again, all of this was more relevant before the varicella vaccine. So hopefully now nobody gets chickenpox at all, but it used to be much worse in infants, much worse in older child, as well as adults. In addition, you're at risk for severe varicella infection if you've had long-term aspirin therapy. That's because this predisposes you to Rye syndrome. You shouldn't be giving aspirin to young kids like this. In addition, you'll be predisposed to severe infection if you have chronic skin or lung diseases. And this will lead to more complications like bacterial superinfections and pneumonia, which makes sense. If your lungs are already kind of compromised, if you're not able to clear bacteria or viruses, then the inflammation caused by chickenpox can just make that worse and make you predisposed to getting a bacterial superinfection or pneumonia. So that was chickenpox, and this typically happens in children. Next, we're going to talk about shingles, which is the reactivation of this virus. So it's still going to be varicella zoster virus, but it's reactivated usually many years later. So let's move on to that. Remember we said that the virus was dormant in the dorsal root ganglia, and they could be dormant for quite some time, for decades, many decades. It then reactivates and starts replicating in the dorsal root ganglia. The virus then travels through the peripheral sensory nerves back to the skin where it manifests as shingles. So remember, it originally traveled through the sensory nerves to get to the dorsal root ganglia. It's just going back in the opposite direction and back to the skin. This usually doesn't happen in everybody. It happens in people as they become immunocompromised for one reason or another. And there are a number of risk factors for varicella zoster reactivation. These are risk factors for shingles. Your immune function tends to decline with age. So as you get older, usually 50s, 60s, your immune function gets worse. That's when we tend to see shingles. In people who have malignancies, who have cancers, they tend to be immunocompromised. They can be on anti-cancer medications, which make them further immunocompromised. That can reactivate um, your varicella and cause shingles as well. HIV infection can of course progress to AIDS, cause you to be immunocompromised and reactivate varicella zoster. People on immunosuppressive therapy, such as for malignancies or for an organ transplant, can also be immunocompromised. People who are malnourished might be immunocompromised, and people who have chronic stress. Stress also makes you immunocompromised. In any case, once you have this reactivation, once you have shingles, it manifests in a slightly different way. You have pain and vesicles on the skin, and these tend to be in a dermatomal distribution. This usually affects one to three dermatomes on one side of the body. The most commonly affected dermatomes are those in the cervical, trigeminal, thoracic, and lumbar regions, but the pain and the vesicles tend to be on one side of the body in kind of a, a straight line dermatomal distribution affecting one to three dermatomes. The pain is typically described as burning, throbbing, and stabbing, and it may come before the rash. They might have this strange pain along one of their ribs before they even have anything on the skin. It's also possible to have allodynia with this. The rash is described as an erythematous macropapular rash at first that then develops into clear vesicles that then becomes pustules and the pustules rupture after three to four days and they then crust over and involute after seven to ten days. In addition with shingles eruptions you can also have fever, headaches, fatigue, paresthesias, and itching. Now there are a couple specific reactivations of, singles, of, of shingles that are worth talking about um, individually. You can have reactivation of varicella zoster virus, essentially shingles, in your genticulate ganglion. When this happens, it's called herpes zoster oticus, also known as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. In this disease, you'll essentially have the manifestations of shingles, but inside your auditory canal, in the external ear. So you can have that rash, you can have that pain inside your ear. Um, you can also have vertigo and sensory neural hearing loss as it affects that relevant cranial nerve, and you can also have ipsilateral facial paralysis. So your face can be kind of droopy, paralyzed on the same sign, side as the ear symptoms. If you have shingles in the ophthalmic division of cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, so you have reactivation of varicella zoster virus in this specific nerve, you can also have herpes zoster ophthalmicus. This is essentially a manifestation of shingles in the eye. You can have conjunctivitis, keratitis, intraocular infections, and this can lead to glaucoma and blindness in severe cases. 
So this has been a mechanism of disease map for chickenpox and shingles. I hope it was helpful in seeing how the etiology of this one virus can progress to these two distinct diseases, sometimes at different stages of life. And I hope it's helpful in seeing how they are connected. Thank you for listening.